Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Johnson Sunmin Miller. Greetings, friends. Uh, so tonight I'm gonna be, I'll do a little bit of reading out of the, um, especially the Pali Sutta. And, um, and also have a little bit of uh, audience participation here. It's like we did uh, last week. And so start us with, I know we just did a bunch of meditating, but um, so let's, sit, let's sit for a moment and just pay attention to the, uh, to the voice that you know, rambles on in, in, in your head. All right. So I'm sure the voice in your head was saying very different things from me. You know, here I am getting ready to, to give a talk. And so the voice I'm hearing is things like, oh, you know, this is probably a stupid exercise. You know, we just sat for 15 minutes. They're just, you know, they're just not going to care about this or, or, gee, I hope they like this talk. Um, or who the hell am I to be sitting here uh, giving this talk? Um, and you know this um, this um, um, well, I mean, this is a big part of a training, right? We we hear these sorts of voices, acknowledge them, set them aside, and return back to what's in front of us. Right? We learn to do that over and over again, and we hear exactly that story. You know, if we story like this that we just enacted here we see this over and over again in the Pali canon where um and it's uh, Siddhartha himself who um who is the a central character in these stories uh where you know here's the this voice of uh, doubt self-aggrandizement fear craving acknowledges it sees through it and uh lets it disappear and in these stories, uh, so often uh, Siddhartha uh, names this voice Mara and personifies it as the, the demon Mara, uh, this demon who will appear uh, usually in disguise, whether as the, the raging elephant trying to create fear or as the, um, you know, the, 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 the desirable woman or the, the Brahmin who's um, Trying to come off as uh, as superior in in wisdom or what have you, and then uh, Siddhartha always sees through the the um, the disguise, recognizes Mara for who he is, names him, and usually at the end of the story, through that acknowledgement, Mara disappears. Um, and this, so here, thing you know, Siddhartha, you know, he, you know you know, awaken under the Bodhi tree, right? And yet we hear these stories about him and, and interacting with Mara from before he sat under the Bodhi tree and woke up uh, after, you know, well up into towards the end of his uh, his life. And so there uh, Siddhartha himself is never free of Mar Mara. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna read excerpts of the, uh, three of these stories and um, see what they, Tell us about this. The first one here is from uh, the Sutta Nipata, which is part of the the fifth of the Nikaya in the, the Sutta Nikaya in the um, in the Pali Canon. Um, and in this story, this is from before uh, Siddhartha waking up under the Bodhi tree. Um, and in this case, Mara comes to him in the disguise of, uh, I guess, seemingly a person. It's not quite clear. Uh, named uh, Namuchi. And uh, let's see, where is it out here? So this is now Siddhartha speaking, describing the event. Namachi approached me, speaking compassionate words. You are thin, pale, you're on the verge of death. So I remember this um, Siddhartha prior to waking up in the Bodhi tree, that's when he was uh, performing those acts of, of extreme asceticism, nearly starving himself to death. 
you get those graphic depictions of his, you know, his ribs uh, and his uh, spinal column sticking out and, and his hair falling out. Um, and so he was describing Mara speaking to him. A thousand parts belong to death. One fraction of your life remains. Live, sir, life is better. While living, make merits. Not exactly a demonic voice, right? It's this compassionate voice. My goodness, you're nearly starving to death. Don't do that. Um, while you are living the spiritual life and performing the fire sacrifices, abundant merit is stored up. Why devote yourself to striving? So here, urging him to uh, return to the, the Vedic practices of the, um, uh, the Brahmins of priests performing the various fire sacrifices. And uh, you could gain merit by either being the person who does them or by uh, donating to the, per for the, to the person to do it. Um, practices that Siddhartha would become critical of throughout his career. Hard to travel is the path for striving, hard to practice, hard to achieve. Speaking these verses, Mara stood in the presence of, of the Buddha. Uh, so he was trying to draw Siddhartha away from his ascetic practices and to return to the, the Vedic practices. Um, um, and so here we have uh, Siddhartha, he, he recognizes Mara for who he is and describes his, his armies or the weapons um, of Mara. Sensual pleasures are your first army. The second is called discontent. Hunger and thirst are third. The fourth is called craving. The fifth is dullness and drowsiness. The sixth is called cowardice. Doubt is your seventh. Your eighth, denigration and pride. Gain, praise and honor and wrongly obtained fame is ninth. The tenth is when one extols oneself and looks down uh, at others. This is your army, Namuchi, the squadron of the dark one. A weakling does not conquer it, but having conquered it, one gains bliss or nirvana. It's basically cataloging the sorts of things that that uh, I hear from that voice in my head. You know, I, I sit, I probably many of you experience as well. You sit down to do zazen in the morning, and or you're about to, and there's that voice like, "Boy, you know, but you're really hungry right now. You're really tired. You know, your meditation isn't going to be good anyway. You know, you've got all this other stuff to do. You might as well just go and have breakfast in, instead." Um, but that's not, you know, so there's that, that voice of Mara, um, but Siddhartha doesn't give into that here. He, um, having seen the bannered army all around and Mara with his vehicle ready, says, I will go out to meet him in battle. May he not dislodge me from my place. Though the world with its devas, though the world with its devas cannot overcome that army of yours, I will destroy it with wisdom, like a fresh clay bowl with a stone. Having gained mastery over my intention and with mindfulness well established, I will wander from realm to realm, guiding many disciples. Heedful and resolute, the, those practitioners of my teaching against her wishes will go to the state where one does not sorrow, uh, nirvana. So he musters up that uh, that um, right resolve, that or, sorry, that right effort um, to um, uh, to to continue on in his practice. And then, um, so just as hopefully we do that, you know, in the morning when we hear that voice, uh, then in the uh, Sangyuta Nikat, there's a um, story in there from about seven years after his awakening, uh, supposedly. Um, here he's meditating alone in the forest uh, when Mara comes to him um, in some disguise or another and says to Siddhartha, um, is it because you are sunk in sorrow that you meditate in the woods because you've lost wealth or pine for it or committed some crime in the village? Why don't you make friends with people? Why don't you form any intimate ties? Siddhartha responds to him, having dug up into knowing exactly who this is, hung up, uh, having dug up entirely the root of sorrow, guiltless, I meditate free from sorrow. Having cut off all greedy urge for existence, I meditate taintless, O kinsman of the negligent. Mara responds to him, and that of which they say it's mine, and those who speak in terms of mine, if your mind exists among these, you won't escape me. Sorry, for mine and mind, it's hard to tell what I'm saying there. You won't escape me. Siddhartha responds, um, that which they speak of is not mine. I'm not one of those who speak of mine. You should know thus, O evil one, even my path you will not see. And Mara responds, if you have discovered the path, the secure way leading to the deathless, be off and walk that path alone. What is the point of instructing others? So he knows here that he's he's lost when it comes to Siddhartha himself. But see what he's trying to do? He's trying to create that sense of doubt. Remember, there's that, most, I'm sure most of us know that story of uh, 
Siddhartha, soon after awakening, that big doubt that he had was whether to go on to teach anybody else. What would be the point of it? Well, Mara, seven years later, comes right back to that and says, hey, you know, remember that doubt? No, there's no real point in that. But again, he summons up right effort and responds, those people going to the far shore ask what lies beyond death's realm. When I ask, I explain to them the truth without acquisitions. Uh, and so he keeps going. He, he um, hears the voice, acknowledges it, sees through it, lets it go and, and carries on uh, with, his, with his work. And that is our, our mindfulness practice, right? Uh, we do this or we, we hope to do this, you know, throughout the day, every day, you know, for the rest of our lives. Um, and one last excerpt out of the Sangyuta Nikaya. And I love this because here's where Mara defines himself, tells us what he is. And I think it's a great insight here. He says, the I is mine, ascetic, forms are mine. Eye contact and space of consciousness are mine. Where can you go to escape from me? The ear is mine, sounds are mine, the nose is mine, odors are mine, the tongue is mine, tastes are mine, the body is mine, tactile objects are mine. The mind is mine. Mental phenomena are mine. Mind contact and its base of consciousness are mine. Where can you go to escape from me? And indeed, where can you go? I mean, look at what Mara is saying he is. You know, he's the, the sense organs, the sense perception. Um, he's effectively all those things at the heart of, of dependent arising. Um, and therefore he is, to quote the pseudos, the origins of this entire mass of suffering. He is, in effect, our bodies. No, so again, uh, Siddhartha, these stories, you know, from before his awakening to near his death, Mara is ever present. How could Mara not be? Because Mara is our bodies. Yes, we carry Mara around with us all the time. Uh, there's a wonderful painting I saw some years ago, and I haven't been able to find it again, where it's of uh, Siddhartha with Mara clinging to his back, basically getting a piggyback ride. And I mean, that's life. We walk around, Mara's on our back, whispering in our ear. Where, where can you go to escape from Mara? There is no, uh, there's only death, right? Um, the Noble Eightfold Path doesn't teach us to kill Mara, uh, but just in those stories over and over again, Mara comes in the disguise, Siddhartha sees through Mara, recognizes him for what he is, acknowledges him. In that acknowledgement, Mara disappears which we've all seen over and over again as we practice, as thoughts arise, we acknowledge them and then uh, let them go. And so we see that even for Siddhartha, um, you know, there wasn't in those, the stories in the Pali Canon, there's no single awakening, right? There's just that, that constant effort throughout, um, throughout uh, life, you know, contending with Mara from moment to moment. And we carry Mara with us everywhere because, well, we have bodies. But what else is our body? Um, and for this, I turn to the plat to his poem in the Platform Sutra, but not that poem. You know, of course, the Platform Sutra, where uh, we're trained, the way we read that usually is um, is uh, Hongren has he's like, okay, uh, somebody's got to take over after me. So you know, everybody go and write your poems, and whoever's poem shows the greatest insight you'll get to be my successor. And everybody just figures, oh, well, Shen Shiyu, he's our, our the head teacher here. So of course he'll get it. And he goes and paints his anonymous poem on the wall. And uh, Hui Nang, you know, the poor guy just working in the, uh, at the, the grinding wheel in the back, it doesn't even get to go in the meditation hall. He sort of sneaks in at night, curious about what everybody, this poem everybody's talking about. And he reads it and he's like, oh, balderdash. And he writes his own, or well, he's illiterate. So he has somebody else write his, his uh, poem for him. And uh, that's supposed to be the brilliant thing. Oh, he totally destroyed uh, Shen Xiu, right? But I, I mean, Shen Xiu, I mean, he was, he was the head teacher. He's not somebody to sneeze at. And I think his poem is great. I love it. Um, especially this first line, our body is the Bodhi tree and our mind is a bright mirror. Carefully, we wipe them hour by hour and let no dust alight. Our body is the Bodhi tree. Well, and it is, you know, there's not like some magical Bodhi tree out there, right? Where we're gonna go and sit under and gain enlightenment. And as Hui Neng tells us over and over again in various ways in Platform Sutra, there's no pure land out there in the, somewhere magically in the West for us to go and become awakened. It, the pure land is right here. The Bodhi tree is right here. We sit under the Bodhi tree all the time. Our body is the Bodhi tree. Our body is Mara. It's these at the, um, it's these at the same time. 
So let's sit for um, let's sit for just a minute again, and uh, once again, listen, listen to Mara. Uh, let's listen and see what Mara says. And let's acknowledge that voice, let it go and come back to what's in front of us again. Um, that's, um, that's the human condition, right? Voice of Mara arises. What do we do? Uh, we can't escape Mara because we have bodies. So what can we do? Acknowledge it, see through it, let it go over and over again. We hear the voice in our ear as we carry Mara around on our backs, but wipe the mirror. So what our lives, um, moment to moment, it's, you know, we're in our bodies. We're Mara, Bodhi tree, Mara, Bodhi tree. So what do you do? Just keep wiping the mirror. Thank you.